grace and peace to you on this first Sunday of Advent. I was just saying to Tim Evers, uh, there's like a, a very exciting buzz in the room. It was wonderful to hear you all um, catch up with one another and, and to be together in this place. Uh, welcome to worship. My name is John Frost. I'm one of the pastors joined by Ann Hatfield and Jenny Clark, uh, two of our pastors. As, and on behalf of all the folks leading in worship today, we uh, welcome you in the room and also those of you on the live stream as well as joining us on the phone lines. I invite you to take a moment in whatever manner makes sense for where you are to sign in a uh, physical guest book or an online guest book. We love to, uh, to hear from you and to know how we might uh, be in conversation or answer any questions you have about the church. Uh, a few things to highlight today. Uh, a new journey class kicks off today following this service, uh, Heaven and Earth. Um, Advent and the Incarnation, uh, following a book by a pastor and writer, Will Willimon. Uh, that'll be at 1045. Uh, as well, in Spellman Hall, I invite you to stop by and check out the Shop for Hope uh, alternative gift market. Uh, this is a wonderful way to support uh, some incredible organizations um, and uh, c consider uh, shopping for uh, family and friends and, and get, get a gift that uh, will support uh, various organizations. Uh, so that will be up all day as well as in through the evening. Uh, if you are heading over to Spellman, also check out, there's an, there will be throughout Advent an interactive uh, window art station. Uh, there will be a, a, a prompt uh, of a question for each week and you're invited to, to grab a marker and, and add your uh, piece to that each week. And uh, tonight, uh, there is an intergenerational Advent night uh, that uh, you are still welcome to register for. Uh, it'll start in here with uh, a worship service. We'll actually be gathered on the chancel, uh, and then we'll move into Spelman for a meal and some Advent-related activities. Uh, so do hope you will check that out. There are several concerts remaining in this season. Uh, the two evening concerts next weekend, uh, Christmas concerts with the chancel choir and orchestra, uh, Saturday evening and Sunday evening, uh, there are still uh, available spots for. And then the following weekend, uh, the group Found Wandering will be here uh, for their Christmas concert, as well as folks from our own uh, Westminster Worship Collective. So uh, some great events still coming. Uh, I was told before the service, ushers for Christmas Eve, uh, Larry Graves uh, mentioned to me, if, if you feel called to be a hospitable presence on Christmas Eve, see Larry Graves or, or one of your ushers. Uh, to how you can sign up. Uh, so let us continue to gather for worship, and I'd like to invite uh, the Carpenter family up to help lead our call to worship and Advent candle lighting. I invite you to join your voices in our call to worship and, and our Advent lighting. We are waiting for the dawn of God's incarnation. Restore us, O oh God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. We are like clay awaiting the pot. Restore us, O oh God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Teach us to keep alert as we wait. Restore us, O oh God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Today we light the candle of hope, a sign of hope of our coming Savior, Jesus Christ. Restore us, O oh God. Let your face shine that we may be saved.
yet we await your arrival, trusting that it will come. There is a sense of urgency in our waiting. We await the birth of Jesus, but we watch for so much more, anticipating all that your incarnation means in a hurting world. Teach us to keep alert that we may not become complacent or convinced that we have time. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Preparing for Christ's coming requires honest examination of our lives and our hearts. Let us turn to God in prayer to confess our sins. You may be seated. <laughs> Let us join our voices in prayer. God with us, even in Advent, we confess that you can seem far away. You are hidden when we need you near. In our hurt, doubt, and fear, we do not try to draw closer to you. Instead, we lash out against you, our neighbor, even those we love. Forgive us, we pray, and come to save us. Let your face shine until our tears are dried, our sins are faded, and our hope is restored. After all, we belong to you, and in your hands we can be made new. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. I'd like to invite any of our younger worshipers in the room to join me up front. And if you're on the live stream, I also want to welcome you. Good morning, everyone. So I have a question. What, what do you see in our sanctuary today that maybe was different from last Sunday? Yeah, I saw your hand first. You see Christmas wreaths. Yeah, what else do you see? Christmas trees. That's all right. Is there anything else that you see? Maybe a different color. There's candles. There are candles. Yeah. How about you in the back there? What do you see? You see the candles too? Yeah. Yeah. I see bells on the roof. There's some bells. Yeah. Anyone who didn't get a chance? Anything else? What What color do I have here? Purple. Yeah. So there's purple here. There's purple behind me on the communion table. There's purple candles. There's there's purple there. Is it your favorite color? You know, it's my daughter's favorite color, too. <laughs> so, today we begin a season of the church year. And I, we, I said it earlier, and we actually said the word in, in our first hymn. It starts with an A. Does it starts with an A. Does anyone know what season we start today? Yeah. Advent. We start Advent. Yes, excellent. Now, Advent means um, arrival or coming. So, whose arrival do you think we're waiting for? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, if, if you know, let's say it on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus. Jesus. So, in Advent, we actually do a couple of things, right? Because Advent, the weeks of Advent lead to a very special day of Christmas. So we actually look back at the way in which Jesus came as a baby. He was born, right? Mary uh, he was born, uh, and we follow that whole story. But at Advent, we also do something else. We look ahead in the future, because Jesus came once, and that's what we celebrate at Christmas, but Jesus also promised that he would come again in the future. And we don't know when that's going to be, but that's the other part of Advent that we look for. So it's almost like we are preparing for, for Jesus to come back. Now, you might have visitors that come visit for Christmas. What are some things that you do to prepare for when they come? Yeah. What do you do? You make sticky buns. You might make food. Yeah. What else? You eat together. Maybe you, if they're going to stay the night, maybe you make sure that there's sheets on their bed, pillowcases, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. What? You set up everything. So you make sure when they, yeah, one more thing. You clean the house, make sure it's nice and clean. All right, ultimate last thing. Blow up the air mattress. Yeah, blow up the air mattress. Yeah, so we do all kinds of things. <laughs> we do all sorts of things to prepare for someone's arrival. And so that's kind of what we do as we wait for Jesus to come. And you know what we can do? We can follow Jesus. We can uh, love our neighbor. We can be kind. We can show Jesus' love to others. That's probably the best way that we can a show that we are waiting for Jesus to come back is by doing what he said and living the way that he would have us live. 
So I'm going to say a prayer for us, and then you all can go to your Kids Connect classes. So thank you. Season of Advent, help us to wait and watch and to prepare for your arrival once again. Help us to love those around us with the love that you have given us. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, as, as the kids make their way to the back of the sanctuary, um, I invite uh, all of God's people to greet one another with the peace of Christ. Let us now join our hearts and minds in a time of prayer. Eternal and holy God, during this season of Advent, help us to prepare Christ's way to await his arrival. As you gather us in this time of worship, center our hearts, minds, and prayers on your holy presence in our midst. With joyful anticipation, keep us awake and alert as we watch for Christ's coming. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, prepare us to welcome your Son as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We marvel, O God, that you came to us so quietly, so humbly, so helplessly. You asked no privileges and claimed no status, but entered human life as we do, as a tiny baby needing to be loved and cherished. Merciful God, it is that compassionate protection that we ask for all your people, for those who feel lost and lonely, for those who live in poverty and hunger, for those who are suffering amid the violence of war, especially the people of Ukraine, and Gaza, and Israel. Grant them all an infilling of your grace and hope. May each person know your immeasurable love and the promise that Christ is coming to make all things new. Comfort, O Lord, all those who are in sorrow and despair. We extend our sympathy to those who are grieving. We remember and give thanks for the life and service of Bob Krauss, who passed away this week. And we ask your comfort for his wife, Jackie Krauss, and their family and friends. We also pray for Nancy Daly and her family at the death of her mother. Lord, surround them with your comfort and mercy in this time of loss and sorrow. And we ask your healing upon those from our congregation who have been recently hospitalized, praying for Ellen Rollins, and those whom we know and love and hold silently in our hearts this day. Emmanuel, God with us, grant them all wholeness and well-being, in body, mind, and spirit. Holy One, you are a God of surprises, so keep us expectant and attentive at the beginning of this Advent season. Together, let us watch for signs of your light breaking into the world. Together, let us await the evidence of your grace in our midst. Together, let us prepare to welcome the Christ child once again into our lives and into the world. We ask this in the name of the Prince of Peace, the light of the world, whose advent we celebrate this season, our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to join our voices, praying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
During this Advent season, we remember that we worship a God of hope, a God of promise. And one of the ways that we remind ourselves is to gather for events like Advent night, and you'll see photos on the screen, opportunities for us as a community of faith, as a beloved people of God, to gather and to respond to the good news of Christ's coming once again into our midst. There are many ways in which you can contribute to the ministries of Westminster, and you'll see opportunities on the slide that we might give generously in response to all that God has already given each of us.
I invite you now to join me in our unison prayer of dedication that we might bless these gifts to Christ's work in the world. Let us pray. Take these gifts we offer today, O oh God, and use them to the fulfillment of Christ's ministry. May these gifts help to free the captives, heal the sick, comfort the lonely, feed the hungry, and heal the wounded. As Christ's hands and feet use us too in service to building your beloved community. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> Our scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. Let us listen to God's word together. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather the elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, our God, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, if you ever visit someone who has recently moved into a new house, you will inevitably be invited to go on a house tour. And you'll ooh and ah your way through dining rooms and living rooms and bedrooms, all the while commenting on the tasteful decorative choices and the efficient use of space and whatever else the occasion may require. Now, in those situations, do you know what would really kill the mood? I mean, if you want to diffuse the joy and pride of the new homeowners and make everyone feel uncomfortable, you might say something like, you know, one day this will all be a huge pile of rubble. That's the context for Mark 13. Mark 13 begins as Jesus wraps up a, an extended time of teaching in the temple, various uh, parables and questions posed to him. And on their way out of the temple grounds, one of the disciples remarks, look what large stones and large buildings, uh, essentially, ooh and ah. And Jesus replies to him, you see these buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. That's how chapter 13 begins. Welcome to Advent, people. <laughs> it's going to be a little uncomfortable at first. We jump right into the thick of it, and in the middle of this chapter, the very first verse refers back to the beginning of the chapter. Jesus says, But in those days after that suffering... You see, after Jesus casually forecasted the doom of the temple, he went on to talk about some pretty dark stuff. 
Nations, kingdoms, even families will turn against one another. Earthquakes, famines, persecution, false messiahs and false prophets suffering unlike anything anyone had ever seen. It's kind of a lot. In, in dealing with a passage like this, we are dealing with the genre of apocalyptic literature in Scripture. And Jesus' words don't exist in a vacuum. He's clearly drawing upon other texts in the Hebrew Scriptures. In other words, he's drawing upon an existing tradition of apocalyptic literature. Nevertheless, these kinds of passages unsettle us. If we were to be walking in a public place and someone were reading Mark 13 through a bullhorn on a street corner, we probably wouldn't pull up a chair and stay a while. We would gather the kids and say, get inside. We would get away from there as quickly as possible. If someone were to casually mention in conversation, you know, I've had some visions lately of the sun darkening and the moon failing to give its light and stars falling from the sky, a great day of reckoning is coming. We wouldn't say, oh, that's so interesting. Do tell me more. We would look for the nearest exit. It's easy for us modern, sophisticated, enlightened folks to dismiss these unsettling passages because of the caricatured versions of them we may have encountered. Predicting the end of the world and preying on our fears. But if we skip over passages like this, we miss the clear and urgent message they contain. Keep awake. What Mark 13 is doing, and, and yes, what even the bullhorn preacher is doing, is saying, wake up. All is not well. There are forces in this world that have set themselves up against the purposes of God. And although it may seem like they have the rule of the day, God is still God, and these forces will be dealt with even dashed to pieces. Apocalyptic passages reveal, that's literally what the, the root of the word means, to reveal, and they, they pull back the curtain of this world to expose the futility of the powers of this world. When we read them, the temptation is to try to pinpoint chronologically when will the events take place that Jesus is talking about. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. That much is clear as well as the message occurring over and over again. Keep alert. Keep awake. Don't be lulled into a comfortable slumber at the way things are. The reality is that there isn't one singular in event in history or in the future to which a passage like this points. The staying power of apocalyptic passages is due to the fact that generations will continue to resonate with them. Some of the earliest readers of Mark's gospel would no doubt think of the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of that very same temple in 70 AD. But we could trace all of history from the 1st to the 21st century and, and ask ourselves, when hasn't the world felt as Jesus describes it here? On edge, with nations and kingdoms clashing. We need only look at the most recent headlines in our own time. The important thing isn't figuring out when these events will happen, but rather acknowledging that they continue to happen so long as we are waiting for the fulfillment of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And when I was in high school, one of the most popular musicals was the musical Rent. Probably because it was quite edgy for the time and, and it leaned heavily on rock music and featured electric guitars. And one of the refrains that occurs a few times throughout the musical uh, especially at climactic plot points, uh, goes like this. There is no future. There is no past. I live this moment as my last. 
And then it builds to this refrain, and the whole cast is singing, No day but today. Now, as a musical, it's very convincing because you're swept up in the emotion of it all, and, and, and they're, they're weaving together themes that have happened throughout all these other songs, and you're sitting there saying, Yeah, no day but today, yes. But as I had some distance from it, I was thinking, actually, no. There, there is a past and a present and a future. And in Advent, they become so perfectly aligned as we see the past, present, and future as though we are looking through a single lens. It's likely that the first resonance Jesus had in mind for what he was talking about would occur beginning in the very next chapter of Mark. In the parable that ends Mark 13 about the, the master leaving the household, Jesus says, Keep awake, for you do not know when the master will return, whether in the evening, at midnight, at cockcrow, or at dawn. Now, all four of those time markers, if you continue to read in, in, in the subsequent chapters of Mark, all four of those time markers show up in the Passion narrative. Jesus shares the Last Supper with the disciples in the evening. The disciples fail to stay awake as Jesus prays in the garden because it's the middle of the night. The cock crows just as Peter denies Jesus. And Jesus is handed over to Pilate as soon as it was morning. What's more, in response to the high priest's question about whether he was the Messiah, Jesus says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. It sounds a lot like chapter 13. It is as though Mark is inviting us to see that the heaven and earth shattering event about which Jesus is speaking is about to take place in his own death and resurrection. This is the manner of our Lord's first coming, his first advent. Humility, vulnerability, suffering, death, and resurrection. This is our past. Even as Jesus gathers up the past of God's people, he, the one in whom are met the hopes and fears of all the years, in the present, we keep awake to the ways in which Jesus is still among us. We look to his first coming to know where to find him. We were reminded of this last week in Matthew 25. We will find Christ in the vulnerable, those on the margins, and the least of these. Like our gathering thought today, it means that we wait in solidarity with all that groans under the birth pangs of the new creation. As time marches on, we continue to keep awake, to wait, even as nations and kingdoms continue to clash. We work, but we know on our own it is not enough. In our journey class book study, Will Willimon writes, if we are to have a future different from the past, it must come as a gift, something not of our devising. What we need is a God who refuses to be trapped in eternity, a creator who is not aloof from our time. We need a God who not only cares about us, but who is willing to show up among us and do something with us here, now. Good news, Advent, marking the church's new year, says in a number of different ways, that's just the sort of God we've got. In Advent, we look back to Christ's first coming. We watch for his presence among us now, and we eagerly await his return. But no one knows the day or hour, therefore keep watch and keep awake. Amen. I invite you now to stand that we might state what it is we believe using these words that are often known as the Christ hymn from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let us state what it is we believe as God's beloved people. 
Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God, Jesus Christ is Lord. Please be seated. We want to especially welcome our, our children from Kids Connect back into the room as we gather at the Lord's table. If Advent is the season where God's past, present, and future, and our past, present, and future align themselves as though looking through one lens, this table is the practice where that also happens, where God's past, present, and future, as well as ours, which is wrapped up in God's past, present, and future. As we gather at this table, we gather at, at Christ's invitation. There's nothing we can do to earn our place here. We come simply because Jesus invites us to come. So friends, let us gather at this table. There is nowhere on earth where you are more welcome. I invite you to join your voices in the opening of our great prayer of thanksgiving. Would you pray with me? The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Lord God, eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor tongue told of a glory like yours, for you fashioned us in your image. Though the pot was broken in your hands in the exile of your people and the rejection of your son, you made an even more wondrous vessel out of agony and estrangement. In Jesus, you glorify your chosen people and inaugurate your church to be his body in the world. In his death, the pot was broken once and for all, but in his resurrection, you refashioned a new pot from the same clay to feed your people forever. Ever-present God, your prophets longed that you would tear the heavens and come down, and in your Son, Jesus Christ, you have come down and filled the earth with the splendor of your dwelling among us. In him you were present to friend and stranger, the intrigued and the suspicious, the betrayer and the bereft. Come down now in the power of your Holy Spirit upon this bread and cup, and make them be for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, as you feed us with this living bread, open the window of your heaven, that your church may glimpse the hope of your glory, and your world may be transfigured by the light of your truth, until that day when heaven finally comes to earth, when your sun returns on the clouds and your spirit infuses your creation with resurrecting grace, and you are all in all. One God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Scripture reminds us that on the night before he died, Jesus had gathered with his friends in an upper room to share a meal. And, and there he took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken and given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. All of you drink of it. Brothers and sisters, as often as we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, we do show the Lord's death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
And we invite our servers to come forward at this time. There will be gluten-free uh, bread being served on the aisle by the piano for anyone who would like to have that. There are also um, prepackaged communion cups in the center aisle here for anyone who would like that.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for meeting us here at this table. Having been fed, now send us out into the world as your people, even as we await your return. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.